This is the radiator, Aunt Josephine said, pointing to a radiator with a pale and skinny finger. Please don't ever touch it. You may find yourself very cold here in my home. I never turn on the radiator because I'm frightened that it might explode. So it often gets chilly in the evenings. Violet and Klaus looked at one another briefly, and Sunny looked at both of them. Aunt Josephine was giving them a tour of their new home, and so far appeared to be afraid of everything in it, from the welcome mat, which Aunt Josephine explained could cause someone to trip and break their neck, to the sofa in the living room, which she said could fall over at any time and crush them flat. This is the telephone, Aunt Josephine said, gesturing to the telephone. It should only be used in emergencies because there's a danger of electrocution. Actually, Klaus said, I've read quite a bit about electricity. I'm pretty sure that the telephone is perfectly safe. Aunt Josephine's hands fluttered to her white hair as if something had jumped onto her head. You can't believe everything you read, she pointed out. I've built a telephone from scratch, Violet said. If you like, I can take the telephone apart and show you how it works. That might make you feel better. I don't think so, Aunt Josephine said, frowning. Delmo, Sunny offered, which probably meant something along the lines of, If you wish, I'll bite the telephone to show you it's harmless. Delmo, Aunt Josephine asked, bending over to pick up a piece of lint from the faded flowery carpet. What do you mean by Delmo? I consider myself an expert on the English language, and I have no idea what the word Delmo means. Is she speaking some other language? Sonny doesn't speak fluently yet, I'm afraid, Klaus said, picking his little sister up. Just baby talk, mostly. Goon! Sonny shrieked, which meant something along the lines of, I object to your calling it baby talk! Well, I'll have to teach you her proper English, Aunt Josephine said stiffly. I'm sure you all need some brushing up on your grammar, actually. Grammar is the greatest joy in life, don't you find? The three siblings looked at one another. Violet was more likely to say that inventing things was the greatest joy in life. Klaus thought reading was. And Sunny, of course, took no greater pleasure than in biting things. The Baudelaire's thought of grammar, all those rules about how to write and speak the English language, the way they thought of banana bread. Fine, but nothing to make a fuss about. Still, it seemed rude to contradict Aunt Josephine. Yes, Violet said finally. We've always loved grammar. Aunt Josephine nodded and gave the Baudelaire's a small smile. Well, I'll show you to your room and continue the rest of the tour after dinner. When you open this door, just push on the wood here. Never use the doorknob. I'm always afraid it will shatter into a million pieces and that one of them will hit my eye. The Baudelaire's were beginning to think that they would not be allowed to touch a single object in the whole house. But they smiled at Aunt Josephine, pushed on the wood, and opened the door to reveal a large, well-lit room with blank white walls and a plain blue carpet on the floor. Inside were two good-sized beds and one good-sized crib, obviously for Sunny, each covered in a plain blue bread bedspread, and at the foot of each bed was a large trunk for storing things. On the other end of the room was a large closet for everyone's clothes, a small window for looking out, and a medium-sized pile of tin cans for no apparent use. I'm sorry that all three of you have to share a room, Aunt Josephine said. But this house isn't very big. I tried to provide you with everything you would need, and I do hope you will be comfortable. I'm sure we will, Violet said, carrying her suitcase into the room. Thank you very much, Aunt Josephine. In each of your trunks, Aunt Josephine said, there is a present. Presents? The Baudelaire's had not received presents for a long, long time. Smiling, Aunt Josephine walked to the first trunk and opened it. 
For Violet, she said. There is a lovely new doll with plenty of outfits for it to wear. Aunt Josephine reached inside and pulled out a plastic doll with a tiny mouth and wide staring eyes. Isn't she adorable? Her name is Pretty Penny. Oh, thank you, said Violet, who, at 14, was too old for dolls and had never particularly liked dolls anyway. Forcing a smile on her face, she took Pretty Penny from Aunt Josephine and patted it on its little plastic head. And for Klaus, Aunt Josephine said, there is a model train set. She opened the second trunk and pulled out a tiny train car. You can set up the tracks in that empty corner of the room. What fun, Klaus said, trying to look excited. Klaus had never liked model trains, as they were a lot of work to put together, and when you were done, all you had was something that went around and around in endless circles. And for little Sammy, Aunt Josephine said, reaching into the smallest trunk, which sat at the foot of the crib. Here is a rattle. See, Sonny, it makes a little noise. Sonny smiled at Aunt Josephine, showing all four of her sharp teeth. But her older siblings knew that Sonny despised rattles and the irritating sounds they made when you shook them. Sonny had been given a rattle when she was very small, and it was the only thing she was not sorry to lose in the enormous fire that had destroyed the Baudelaire home. It's so generous of you, Violet said, to give us all these things. She was too polite to add that they weren't things they particularly liked. Well, I am very happy to have you here, Aunt Josephine said. I love Grandma so much. I'm excited to be able to share my love of Grandma with three nice children like yourselves. Well... I'll give you a few minutes to settle in, and then we'll have some dinner. See you soon. Aunt Josephine, Klaus asked. What are these cans for? Those cans? For burglars, naturally, Aunt Josephine said, patting the bun of hair on top of her head. You must be as frightened of burglars as I am. So every night, simply paste those tin cans right by the door so that when burglars come in, they'll trip over the cans and you'll wake up. But what will we do then, when we're awake in a room with an angry burglar? Violet asked. I would prefer to sleep through a burglary. Aunt Josephine's eyes grew wide with fear. Angry burglars? She repeated. What are you talking about, angry burglars? Are you trying to make us all even more frightened than we already are? Uh, of course not, Violet stuttered, not pointing out that Aunt Josephine was the one who had brought up the subject. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to frighten you. Well, we'll say no more about it, Aunt Josephine said, looking nervously at the tin cans, as if a burglar were tripping on them at that very minute. I'll see you at the dinner table for a few minutes. The new guardian shut the door, and the Baudelaire orphans listened to her footsteps padding down the hallway before they spoke. Sonny can have Pretty Penny, Violet said, handing the doll to her sister. The plastic's hard enough for chewing, I think. And you can have the model trains, Violet, Klaus said. Maybe you could take apart the engines and invent something. But that leaves you with the rattle, Violet said. That doesn't seem fair. Shoo! Sonny shrieked, which probably meant, like, It's been a long time since anything in our lives has been fair. The Baudelaire's looked at one another with bitter smiles. Sonny was right. It wasn't fair that their parents had been taken away from them. It wasn't fair that the evil and revolting Count Olaf was pursuing them wherever they went, caring for nothing but their fortune. It wasn't fair that they moved from relative to relative, with terrible things happening at each of their new homes, as if the Baudelaire's were riding on some horrible bus that stopped only at stations of unfairness and misery. 
And, of course, it certainly wasn't fair that Klaus only had a rattle to play with in his new home. Aunt Josephine obviously worked very hard to prepare this room for us, Violet said sadly. She seems to be a good-hearted person. We shouldn't complain even to ourselves. You're right, Klaus said, picking up the rattle and giving it a half-hearted little shake. We shouldn't complain. Tree! Sunny shrieked, which probably meant something like, Both of you are right. We shouldn't complain. Klaus walked over to the window and looked out at the darkening landscape. The sun was beginning to set over the inky depths of Lake Lacrimos, and a cold evening wind was beginning to blow. Even from the other side of the glass, Klaus could feel a small chill. I want to complain anyway, he said. Soup's on! Aunt Josephine called from the kitchen. Please come to dinner! Violet put her hand on Klaus's shoulder and gave it a little squeeze of comfort. And without another word, the three Baudelaires headed back down the hallway and into the dining room. Aunt Josephine had set the table for four, providing a large cushion for Sunny and another pile of tin cans in the corner of the room, just in case burglars tried to steal their dinner. Normally, of course, Aunt Josephine said. Soup's on is an idiomatic expression that has nothing to do with soup. It simply means that dinner is ready. In this case, however, I've actually made soup. Oh, good, Violet said. There's nothing like hot soup on a chilly evening. Actually, it's not hot soup, Aunt Josephine said. I never cook anything hot because I'm afraid of turning the stove on. It might burst into flames. I've made chilled cucumber soup for dinner. The Baudelaires looked at one another and tried to hide their dismay. As you probably know, chilled cucumber soup is a delicacy that is best enjoyed on a very hot day. I myself once enjoyed it in Egypt while visiting a friend of mine who works as a snake charmer. When it is well prepared, chilled cucumber soup has a delicious minty taste, cool and refreshing, as if you were drinking something as well as eating it. But on a cold day in a drafty room, chilled cucumber soup is about as welcome as a swarm of wasps at a bar mitzvah. In dead silence, the three children sat down at the table with their Aunt Josephine and did their best to force down the cold, slimy concoction. The only sound was of Sunny's four teeth chattering on her soup spoon as she ate her frigid dinner. As I'm sure you know, when no one is speaking at the dinner table, the meal seems to take hours, so it felt like much, much later when Aunt Josephine broke the silence. My dear husband and I never had children, she said, because we were afraid to. But I do want you to know that I'm very happy that you're here. I'm often very lonely up on this hill by myself. So when Mr. Poe wrote to me about your troubles, I didn't want you to be as lonely as I was when I lost my dear Ike. Was Ike your husband? Violet asked. Aunt Josephine smiled but she didn't look at Violet, as if she were talking more to herself than to the Baudelaires. Yes, she said in a faraway voice. He was my husband, but he was much more than that. He was my best friend, my partner in grammar, and the only person I knew who could whistle with crackers in his mouth. Our mother could do that, Klaus said, smiling. Her specialty was Mozart's Fourteenth Symphony. Ike's was Beethoven's Fourth Quartet, Aunt Josephine replied. Apparently, it's a family characteristic. I'm sorry we never got to meet him, Violet said. He sounds wonderful. He was wonderful, Aunt Josephine said, stirring her soup and blowing on it even though it was ice cold. I was so sad when he died. I felt like I had lost the two most special things in my life. Two? Violet asked. What do you mean? 
I lost Ike, Aunt Josephine said. And I lost Lake Lacrimos. I mean, I didn't really lose it, of course. It's still down in the valley. But I grew up on its shores. I used to swim in it every day. I knew which beaches were sandy and which were rocky. I knew all the islands in the middle of its waters and all the caves alongside its shores. Lake Lacrimos felt like a friend to me. But when it took poor Ike away from me, I was too afraid to go near it anymore. I stopped swimming in it. I never went to the beach again. I even put away all my books about it. The only way I can bear to look at it is from the wide window in the library. Library? Klaus asked, brightening. You have a library? Well, of course, Aunt Josephine said. Where else would I keep all my books on grammar? If you've finished all your your soup, I'll show you the library. I couldn't eat another bite, Violet said truthfully. Erm, Sonny shrieked in agreement. No, no, Sonny, Aunt Josephine said. Erm is not grammatically correct. You mean to say, I have also finished my supper. Erm, Sonny insisted. My goodness, you do need grammar lessons, Aunt Josephine said. All the more reason to go to the library. Come, children. Leaving behind their half-full soup bowls, the Baudelaire's followed Aunt Josephine down the hallway, taking care not to touch any of the doorknobs they passed. At the end of the hallway, Aunt Josephine stopped and opened an ordinary-looking door. But when the children stepped through the door, they arrived in a room that was anything but ordinary. The library was neither square nor rectangular, like most rooms, but curved in the shape of an oval. One wall of the oval was dedicated to books, rows and rows and rows of them, and every single one of them was about grammar. There was an encyclopedia of nouns placed in a series of simple wooden bookshelves curved to fit the wall. There were very thick books on the history of verbs, lined up in metal bookshelves that were polished to a bright shine. And there were cabinets made of glass, with adjective manuals placed inside them as if they were for sale in a store instead of in someone's house. In the middle of the room were some comfortable-looking chairs, each with its own footstool, so one could stretch out one's legs while reading. But it was the other wall of the oval, at the far end of the room, that drew the children's attention. From floor to ceiling, the wall was a window, just one enormous curved pane of glass. And beyond the glass was a spectacular view of Lake Lacrimos. When the children stepped forward to take a closer look, they felt as if they were flying high above the dark lake instead of merely looking out on it. This is the only way I can stand to look at the lake, Aunt Josephine said in a quiet voice. From far away. If I get much closer, I remember my last picnic on the beach with my darling Ike. I warned him to wait an hour before eating before he went into the lake. But he only waited 45 minutes. He thought that was enough. Did he get cramps? Klaus asked. That's what's supposed to happen if you don't wait an hour before you swim. That's one reason, Aunt Josephine said. But in Lake Lacrimos, there is another. If you don't wait an hour after eating, the Lacrimos leeches will smell food on you and attack. Leeches? Violet asked. Leeches, Klaus explained, are a bit like worms. They're blind and live in bodies of water, and in order to feed, they attach themselves to you and suck your blood. Violet shuddered. How horrible! Swell! Sunny shrieked, which probably meant something along the lines of, Why in the world would you go swimming in a lake full of leeches? The lacrimose leeches, Aunt Josephine said, are quite different from regular leeches. They each have six rows of very sharp teeth and one very sharp nose. 
They can smell even the smallest bit of food from far, far away. The lacrimose leeches are usually quite harmless, preying only on small fish. But if they smell food on a human, they will swarm around him and... and... Tears came to Aunt Josephine's eyes, and she took out a pale pink handkerchief and dabbed them away. I apologize, children. <laughs> it is not grammatically correct to end a sentence with the word and, but I get so upset when I think about Ike that I cannot talk about his death. We're sorry we brought it up, Klaus said quickly. We didn't mean to upset you. That's quite all right, Aunt Josephine said, blowing her nose. It's just that I prefer to think of Ike in other ways. Ike always loved sunshine, and I like to imagine that wherever he is now, it's as sunny as can be. Of course, nobody knows what happens to you after you die, but it's nice to think that my husband someplace very, very hot, don't you think? Yes, I do, Violet said. It's very nice. She swallowed. She wanted to say something else to Aunt Josephine, but when you have only known someone for a few hours, it is difficult to know what they would like to hear. Aunt Josephine, she said timidly, have you ever thought of moving someplace else? Perhaps if you live somewhere far away from Lake Lacrimos, you might feel better. We go with you, Klaus piped up. Oh, I could never sell this house, Aunt Josephine said. I'm terrified of realtors. The three Baudelaire youngsters looked at one another surreptitiously, a word which here means, well, Aunt Josephine wasn't looking. None of them had ever heard of a person who was frightened of realtors. There are two kinds of fears, rational and irrational, or in simpler terms, fears that make sense and fears that don't. For instance, the Baudelaire orphans have a fear of Count Olaf, which makes perfect sense, because he is an evil man who wants to destroy them. But if you were afraid of lemon meringue pie, this would be an irrational fear, because lemon meringue pie is delicious and has never hurt a soul. Being afraid of a monster under the bed is perfectly rational, because there may, in fact, be a monster under your bed at any time, ready to eat you all up. But a fear of realtors is an irrational fear. Realtors, as I'm sure you know, are people who assist in the buying and selling of houses. Besides occasionally wearing a ugly yellow coat, the worst a realtor can do to you is show you a house that you find ugly, and so it is completely irrational to be terrified of them. As Violet, Klaus, and Sunny looked down at the dark lake and thought about their new lives with Aunt Josephine, they experienced a fear themselves. And even a worldwide expert on fear would have had difficulty saying whether this was a rational fear or an irrational fear. The Baudelaire's fear was that misfortune would soon befall them. On one hand, this was an irrational fear, because Aunt Josephine seemed like a good person, and Count Olaf was nowhere to be seen. But on the other hand, the Baudelaire's had experienced so many terrible things that it seemed rational to think that another catastrophe was just around the corner. 